Welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each week, Sam breaks down the highest yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello and welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. In this podcast, I cover the excretory system. So I talk first about the difference between the excretory system and related organ systems like the urinary system and the digestive system. Then I talk about some important anatomical structures that are part of the excretory system. And then last, I get into some physiology where I discuss the physiology of a few of these components of the excretory system. And this material is going to show up on one of the four MCAT sections that's going to be bio biochem. I hope this podcast helps in your studies. And as always, good luck to those of you who are taking the MCAT soon. Before the podcast starts, I just wanted to let everybody know I am participating in a Behind the Mic Live, which is going to be a Facebook, YouTube live event. It's going to be September 24th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And essentially, it's just going to be me as well as two of the other med school coach podcast hosts talking about how we got into podcasting and kind of going through how we put together episodes of our podcast and maybe a little bit about our journey in medicine. Again, that's going to be on September 24th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can go sign up for this event early if you want. You can go to go.medschoolcoach.com backslash podcast to do that. The main function of the excretory system is to remove excess, unnecessary materials from different bodily fluids in order to maintain homeostasis. These excess, unnecessary materials include things like metabolic breakdown products of sugars, fats, and proteins, excess electrolytes like sodium, ingested toxins and drugs, and then also gases, especially carbon dioxide, which builds up as a result of cellular metabolism. And the excretory system is not to be confused with the digestive system or the urinary system. They play similar roles, but I think it's important to understand the differences between those three systems. So the role of the digestive system is to break down our food into small bits that the body can then absorb. So one way to think about it is the digestive system is what's going in. Now, as I said, the excretory system is removing excess unnecessary materials. So you can think about the excretory system as taking things out. So digestive system is in, excretory system is out. Now, the urinary system is contained within the excretory system. The urinary system plays a role in producing, storing, and eliminating urine. And it's also known as the renal system. And this has a lot to do with the kidneys. I already talked about the renal system and renal physiology in another podcast. So if you want to learn more about the kidneys and the nephron and what goes on in the kidneys, uh, then go listen to that podcast. But This is all to say that the urinary system is only part of the excretory system, right? That is the elimination of a urine specifically. There's still many other ways that our body eliminates substances from the body. So to recap that all, digestive system is absorption of nutrients. The excretory system is the excretion of substances. And then the urinary system falls under the excretory system, and that is the excretion of urine. Next, I want to get into some of the anatomy of the excretory system, and there's some important organs to know. That's going to be the bladder, the kidney, or kidneys, the liver, skin, lungs, and large intestine. And these all play different but important roles within the excretory system. So let's start with the kidney. So as I said a little bit earlier, I already did a whole podcast on the renal system. The kidney is an extremely important organ, Um, especially on the MCAT, you're going to see that come up. In terms of their anatomy, we have two kidneys and they're bean shaped and they're located at the middle back of your trunk. An easy way to remember where these are at is to think about a boxer doing a kidney punch. If you've ever seen it, it is to the lower back kind of on each side. So that's just kind of how I remember where the kidneys are located. Now, right on top of each of the kidneys is a white glob of cells. And this glob of cells looks a little bit like melted ice cream that's kind of starting to drip down the kidney. And these globs 
one on each kidney are the adrenal glands, and they produce three types of steroid hormones, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, and androgens. But of course, since this is a podcast on the excretory system, I'm not going to get into those hormones. And if I was to slice the kidney in half, what I would see is a bunch of little tubes. And these little tubes are the functional unit of the kidney, and they're called nephrons. And your kidney contains about a million of these little nephrons, and they're capable of filtering toxins, salts, and water out of your blood. And if you want to know exactly how that works, go listen to the Renal Physiology podcast I put out a while ago. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. It's a complicated process, and even students with great grades and MCAT scores get left out. That's why more students than ever are turning to Med School Coach for admissions advising. Our advisors are all physicians and former admissions committee members, so they know exactly what medical schools are looking for. One-on-one admissions advising from Med School Coach makes all the difference. Our expert team will help you develop a game plan, prepare your application, edit your essays, and coach you for interviews. Every pre-med has a story, and we'll help you tell it so you can stand out from the crowd. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10%, up to $400, on a Med School Coach admissions advising package. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and Med School Coach can help. Now, the bladder is an organ that is connected to the kidneys by a tube that's called the ureter. And a little aside about the ureter is there's two of them because there's two kidneys and they're actually really long. They're about a foot long. So the connection between your kidneys and your bladder is like this foot long tube that is in the middle of your abdomen, which is a bit strange. But anyways, the bladder itself is a triangle shaped hollow organ that is located in the lower abdomen. And its purpose is to store urine that is created by the kidneys. And in terms of its structure, there is a layer of muscle surrounding an inner lining. And this layer of muscle helps push out the urine when it is time to pee. So again, urine is produced by the kidney. It flows into the ureter to the bladder. And from the bladder, it travels through the urethra and is expelled outside the body, hopefully into a toilet. And this is a dumb little mnemonic, but I always remember that the urethra is after the bladder because when you really, really, really need to pee, it comes out of the urethra and you're like, ah, dumb, but it works for me. Um, The next organ here is the liver. And the liver is a large reddish brown organ and you know if you've ever eaten liver meat first of all i'm sorry if you have eaten liver meat because it's nasty but second of all you know it's a very deep dark red color and i should also note it is the heaviest organ in the body and accounts for about two to three percent of your body weight now the liver sits pretty high up in your abdominal cavity it sits essentially right below the diaphragm and it consists of two main lobes a right lobe and a left lobe. And these lobes are separated by a ligament that's called the falciform ligament. And if you were to take a microscope and zoom in on this tissue, this liver tissue, you would see that it's made up of these really small units. And these small units are called hepatic lobules. And these lobules are hexagonal in shape, so they kind of look a little bit like honeycomb. And at the corners of this hexagon that is the hepatic lobule sits what's called a portal triad. And the triad is made up of a portal venule, a portal arterial, and a bile duct. So essentially, you have this hexagon, and then at each corner of the hexagon, you have three little tubes. In addition to those components, you also have a central vein and you have sinusoids. Central vein is just a vein that runs right through the center of these hepatic lobules. Sinusoids are enlarged capillaries through which blood travels from the portal triad, so portal venule and portal portal arterial, into the central vein. So essentially, sinusoids just allow blood to flow from the portal triads into this middle central vein. And to me, this is where it gets interesting. So as I said, there are three components to this portal triad. There's a venule, 
there's an arterial, and there's a bile duct. And as I also just said, the blood flows from these venules and arteries through what's called a sinusoid into this middle central vein. So blood flow in a hepatic lobule goes from the kind of corners of the hexagon into the middle. Now, when we look at the bile duct, which remember was also part of this portal triad, the flow of bile is actually in the opposite direction. So bile is produced by the hepatocytes in the liver and then moves from inside the lobule towards the outside where it makes its way eventually to the bile duct. So why do I find this so interesting? Who knows? It's just kind of cool. The blood flows in one direction from the outside of this hexagon to the inside, and the bile flows from the inside to the outside. So you've essentially got these cross streams of blood and bile. And of course, they're not in the same tube traveling together like in opposite directions, but they run parallel to each other in opposite directions. Pretty sweet. So to recap all of that, the liver is broken down into two lobes, the right and the left lobe. And each of these lobes is further broken down into smaller functional units called hepatic lobules. And these lobules are hexagonal in shape. And at the corners formed by this hexagon-shaped hepatic lobule are what's known as the portal triad, which includes a venule, arterial, and bile duct. And I'll get into the physiology of the liver and kind of what its role is later in the podcast. For now, just understand its general structure. The skin is the next organ in the excretory system I want to talk about, and it's made up of three distinct layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. And the main way that the skin is involved in the excretory system is through sweating. So I want to talk about sweat glands in the skin and kind of where they live and what they look like. Sweat glands look like a coiled hose that extends from below the surface of the skin all the way up to the skin where the coiled part of this hose lives kind of deep down in the skin, and then the hose extends up, up, up until it reaches the surface of the skin. And the coiled part that is way down in the skin is the secretory portion of the sweat glands. This is where the sweat is actually produced. And it usually sits all the way down in the dermis, but is sometimes found even deeper into the skin in the hypodermis. And each of these sweat glands is connected to a pore that is on the surface of the skin. So again, you got a coiled portion of this sweat gland. That's where the sweat is actually produced. And then that makes its way up this long tube to a pore on the skin where it is exposed to the surface of the skin. And according to a textbook called Hyperhidrosis and Botulinium Toxin in Dermatology, what a name, there are between two and four million sweat glands across the whole body. And just for your information, hyperhidroitis is a condition in which your sweat glands over secrete sweat, which would not be a good condition to have, obviously. The next organ that I want to talk about in the excretory system are the lungs. You obviously have two lungs. They are important for expelling waste gases. Lung anatomy is probably not that important to understand for the MCAT, but I will say that the lungs are made up of a right and left lobe, and they are connected to the throat via the trachea, which is where the air goes down originally, and then the trachea branches off into the bronchi. So you have a primary bronchi, a secondary bronchi, and a tertiary bronchi. So these tubes essentially just keep branching and branching into smaller and smaller tubes as you get deeper and deeper into the lungs. And eventually you make it to the end of these tubes and you have what is known as the alveolus or plural is alveoli. And the alveoli, which should not be confused with the more tasty ravioli, are essentially the functional units of the lungs. This is where the gas exchange occurs. All right, so the last structure I wanna talk about here in terms of the excretory system is the large intestine. And I talked about this in quite a bit of detail in the Digestive System podcast, but just for you, I will recap its anatomy. The large intestine essentially frames these small intestines, like a wood frame around a photo. You can imagine these small intestines as these kind of wiggly, squiggly, back and forth intestines. Then around that, you have almost this perfect rectangle that is the large intestine. And the large intestine is not called the large intestine because it's longer than the small intestine. 
It's called the large intestine because the diameter is a lot greater than the small intestine. So for instance, the large intestine has a diameter that's about three times that of the small intestine. And the large intestine is divided up into four regions, the cecum, the colon, the rectum, and the anus. The colon, which is the largest segment of the large intestine, is broken down into four parts. The ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. And those are all in order in which a bowel movement would see those parts of the large intestine. So if I were to make you into a bowel movement, the first thing you would see as you entered the large intestine would be the cecum. And as you entered the colon, you would see first the ascending colon, then you'd go up the ascending colon, then you'd go across the transverse colon, then down the descending colon into the sigmoid colon. And then from there, you'd go into the rectum, and eventually you would be expelled out the anus. All right, so that's a little bit of a primer into some of the anatomy of the different structures within the excretory system. I think the most important thing to understand is some of the physiology and you know how the body gets rid of these certain molecules that are excess or that are toxic or whatever it may be. So that's what I want to get into next is the physiology of the excretory system. At Med School Coach, we know that studying for the MCAT exam can be challenging, especially for busy students on the go. That's why our team created MCAT Prep, the only all-encompassing study app built specifically for the MCAT. MCAT Prep by Med School Coach provides student access to extremely high-quality content and a personalized curriculum for free. The app has more than 250 videos, 1,000 flashcards, and 1,000 unique MCAT questions. Plus, MCAT Prep by Med School Coach allows students to create a personalized study schedule and track progress over time. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into medical school. And now you can put the experts from Med School Coach into your pocket. It's the closest pre-med students can come to a personal tutor without spending a penny. Download MCAT Prep by Med School Coach for free at medschoolcoach.com slash MCAT or download it directly from the Apple Store or Google Play Store. You can achieve your medical school dreams and MCAT Prep by Med School Coach can help. I'm going to present the physiology of the excretory system in terms of the waste molecules our body needs to get rid of. So what I'll do is I'll say for this group of molecules, these are the structures involved, and this is how these structures are involved. And there's four different groups of molecules that I'm going to talk about. The first being byproducts of the metabolic breakdown of sugar, fat, and protein. Number two being excess electrolytes the third being toxins and drugs, and the fourth being waste gas. So let's start with byproducts that are created through the breakdown of proteins, fats, and lipids. The breakdown of amino acids results in the formation of ammonia, which is NH3, and ammonia is toxic, so it must be excreted out. In order to do this, we convert ammonia to urea through the urea cycle, and then we urinate out this urea. The overall reaction for the urea cycle is the following. Two ammonia react with carbon dioxide and three ATP to produce urea, water, and three ADP. Right off the bat, this overall reaction should tell you one important thing, and that's that this process requires energy, right? You're using three ATP to convert this ammonia to urea. Now, there's a shit ton of steps to the urea cycle, this overall reaction is, is really a simplified version of the urea cycle. Um, and I don't think it's important to understand all the steps for the MCAT. However, I think it's good to have a general understanding of what's going on in the urea cycle. So I've broken this down into three different points that you should understand about the urea cycle. So first of all, one of the first steps in the urea cycle is that glutamate and aspartate are both deaminated meaning that their amine group is taken. And remember, glutamate and aspartate are both amino acids. And so amino acids have an amine group and a carboxylic acid group, hence the name amino acids. So essentially, one of the first steps is that these two amino acids have their nitrogen taken, hence they are deaminated. Now, the second thing to understand is that these two amine groups that are essentially stripped from these amino acids are fed into the urea cycle where they eventually produce urea. And urea is a molecule that has two amine groups and a carbonyl carbon. 
So I would know that structure, but just know that each of those amine groups that is in urea are both coming from either glutamate or aspartate, and it's coming from them being deaminated. The third thing that you should understand about the urea cycle, and this is going to sound a little bit obvious, but it's a cycle, just like the Krebs cycle. And what makes it a cycle is that the molecules that are participating in the reactions are regenerated and fed back into the cycle to keep the cycle going. For example, there's a molecule called ornithine that is produced in the last step of the urea cycle. This molecule is then fed back into the urea cycle where it acts as one of the first reactants. It actually reacts with a molecule called carbamyl phosphate to produce citrulline. So again, the three things to know about the urea cycle are number one, glutamate and aspartate are deaminated, meaning that their amine groups are taken away from them. And these two amine groups are the amine groups that make up urea, the two amine groups that make up urea. And number two was then know the structure of urea. And then number three, understand that the urea cycle is a cycle and kind of understand why it is a cycle and what makes a biological or I guess biochemical cycle. And one thing you're probably wondering is, okay, great, you introduced all these anatomical structures. Where does this urea cycle occur? Well, the urea cycle occurs in the liver. And more specifically, it occurs in the cytoplasm in the mitochondria of hepatocytes, which are liver cells. And once this urea is produced in the liver, it travels into the bloodstream and is subsequently excreted by the kidney in urine. And to tie this back to the anatomy that I talked about earlier in terms of the liver, hepatocytes on the periphery of the liver lobules, which again are these hexagonal shaped structures, the cells near the edge of this hexagon are the ones that produce the most urea. And this urea then makes its way into the central vein through the sinusoids, where then it can make its way into systematic circulation and eventually to the kidneys. An adult human produces approximately 25 grams of urea a day. And using the density of urea, which is about 1.32 grams per centimeter cubed, I calculated that 25 grams of urea is approximately 19 centimeters cubed. That's the size of a small ice cube. The last thing that I want to mention about urea and nitrogen excretion is that nitrogen excretion is different depending upon the species that we're talking about. Mammals like me produce and excrete urea in order to get rid of nitrogen. Um, and that's what I just described. And because of that, I am called a uretelic organism. Fish, on the other hand, like you, are able to directly excrete ammonia. And because of that, they are called ammonitelic organisms. Lastly, birds and reptiles excrete uric acid to get rid of their nitrogen. And as a result, they are called urecotelic organisms. And it is for this reason why bird shit is so gross, if you ever wondered. And that is because this uric acid is actually water insoluble and tends to form a white paste or powder. And so I'm sure you've seen bird poop and it's really nasty and it's kind of, it, it does, it looks like chalk almost. And the reason that it looks like chalk is because there's a bunch of uric acid in it. So overall, you can remember that mammals secrete urea and therefore are ureatelic organisms. Fish secrete ammonia and are ammonitelic organisms, and then birds and reptiles secrete uric acid and are urecotelic organisms. So that's a bit about getting rid of excess nitrogen that comes from amino acids. The next thing I want to talk about here is bile. So bile contains bile salts, which are important for emulsifying fats. I talked ad nauseum about them in the Digestive System podcast. But bile also contains an important breakdown product called bilirubin. And bilirubin is this orangish, yellowish compound that is a product of heme metabolism. Heme is an iron-containing prosthetic group found in a number of proteins such as hemoglobin, myoglobin, cytochrome P450, and its main function is to bind oxygen. And it's important to understand that Heme groups are constantly being created and destroyed. There's no such thing as the law of conservation of heme. This is a result of the continual turnover of red blood cells, which red blood cells have a lifespan of about 120 days. 
So once these heme groups are degraded and destroyed, they become bilirubin or they can, they're converted to bilirubin. And this bilirubin is then transported to the liver where it is combined with bile salts and some other components to make bile. And then once this bile is created, it goes into the gallbladder where it's stored and then eventually released into the intestines. And from there, some interesting stuff happens. The bacteria actually metabolizes this bilirubin. It contains enzymes or or bacteria contain enzymes that are able to do that. And so once this bilirubin is metabolized, it's broken down into some smaller molecules that can then be either excreted in the feces or can be reabsorbed and then excreted by the kidneys in urine. So essentially, this breakdown product of heme called bilirubin is transported to the kidney where it's combined with bile. And then once this bile makes its way into the intestines, the bacteria in the intestines are actually able to break down the bilirubin into different metabolites that can then either be excreted in feces or in urine. Pretty sweet. The last molecule I want to talk about here, and this molecule is a byproduct of many different metabolic processes, including the breakdown of carbohydrates, that is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is produced in many different metabolic processes, including the Krebs cycle. Um, And as you probably know, if levels of CO2 are too high in the blood, this can result in the blood becoming acidic, and it's called acidosis. And this happens when the CO2 dissolves in the blood and is converted to carbonic acid. So it's very important that the body gets rid of excess carbon dioxide. And as you can probably assume, the lungs actually play a huge role in excreting this carbon dioxide. Essentially what happens is that this carbon dioxide that's in the blood is exchanged into the lungs through the alveoli, and from there it is actually exhaled when you breathe out. And that is how the lungs play a very important role in carbon dioxide excretion. Pretty simple. So let's talk now about electrolyte excretion. So there are three main places where electrolytes are excreted. And here I'm talking specifically about sodium because it's kind of the best example. So the first and most important way that sodium is excreted is in the kidneys. Sodium is reabsorbed in every single segment of the nephron. Again, you can go listen to the podcast on this if you have not. And this is regulated in many different ways, including the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and the atrial natriuretic peptide system. And so this allows our body to regulate the amount of sodium that is in the plasma and excrete the excess when necessary into the urine. And this is how about 90% of the sodium that we need to excrete is excreted. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to a medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. That's why more students than ever are turning to MCAT tutoring by Med School Coach. Our tutors are all 99th percentile scorers, have been through rigorous training, and can help raise your MCAT score by 12 points or more. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into med school. So why not get one-on-one tutoring from Med School Coach? Our expert team will create a custom program just for you and help you master MCAT content where you need the help most. You'll raise your MCAT score. We guarantee it. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10% up to $400 on a Med School Coach MCAT tutoring package. You can achieve your medical school dreams and Med School Coach can help. The second way that we excrete sodium is through sweat. And the main function of sweat is actually to cool our bodies down. However, it plays kind of a side role in excreting these electrolytes, especially salt. So according to a paper from the International Journal of Sports Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism, sweat is composed of many different electrolytes. For instance, sodium was measured to be at about 0.9 grams per liter of sweat, potassium at about 0.2 grams per liter of sweat, and then calcium and magnesium at much lower concentrations. The third way that I want to mention that salt or electrolytes are excreted is through feces. So feces contains many different ions. For instance, sodium and potassium are kind of the main electrolytes that are found in stool. 
Calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, phosphate, sulfate, and others are also present, but found at much lower concentrations. And this is where the large intestine comes in, because the large intestine is actually able to secrete electrolytes, including sodium. So a lot of those electrolytes that are found in the stool are actually secretions from the large intestine. The next thing I want to touch on here, and this is just very briefly, is what happens to toxins and drugs. So toxin and drug metabolism mostly occurs in the liver. So the liver's primary mechanism for metabolizing these compounds is a very specific group of cytochrome P450 enzymes. For a majority of drugs and toxins, they must be metabolized in order for them to be secreted. So most drugs and some toxins are lipid soluble, which makes them pretty difficult to excrete. So when these drugs are metabolized by the liver, what's going on is it's actually turning those compounds into more water-soluble compounds, and this helps facilitate the excretion of these drugs and toxins into bodily fluids like urine and bile, which can then be excreted in urine and feces. Plus, when these drugs or toxins are metabolized by the liver cells, this typically decreases their effect, which is bad when we're talking about a drug that's supposed to help you, but good for toxins. And I will mention that these processes occur in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of hepatocytes. Remember, smooth endoplasmic reticulum plays a role in detoxification. And the last molecule I said I was going to mention is the excretion of waste gas. And I kind of already mentioned this because I talked about the excess CO2 that is produced in metabolism of carbohydrates and how we breathe that out in the lungs and how that contributes to the excretory system. I will also mention that excess water is breathed out. So when you are exhaling, you are exhaling water as well as carbon dioxide. And that is it for this MCAT Basics podcast. As always, if you like what we do, please go leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us in the rankings. It helps us reach more people. And if you have pre-med friends who maybe are studying for the MCAT or getting ready to prepare, just tell them about the podcast. Word of mouth really helps. And I appreciate that. Thanks for listening and look out for the next one. Thanks for listening to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast. If you're a pre-med, you'll want to check out prospectivedoctor.com for tons of free tools, articles, and more podcasts that cover your pre-med life. And if you need help on the MCAT or getting into med school, check out medschoolcoach.com for the experts.